please uh, turn with me, if you would, to Luke chapter 10. Uh, Luke chapter 10, and we'll be reading uh, verses uh, 38 through 41. Luke chapter 10, verses 38 through 41. Uh, you can find this uh, beginning at the bottom of page 1028 in the Pew Bible. Uh, for those of you who are uh, regular visitors in the evening, uh, you were quite likely expecting a rather different subject uh, this evening, but uh, we switched our, our normal pattern uh, today and had a catechetical uh, sermon this morning. Uh, this evening, we continue uh, what has been our morning habit of working our way through the Gospel of Luke. And we have come now to Luke uh, chapter 10, uh, beginning with verse 38. Hear the word of the Lord. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things, but only one thing is needed. Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. Thus far, God's word. Uh, dear brothers and sisters, friends, I suspect that you will uh, probably agree with me that uh, it seems rather remarkable uh, that this little account is included in God's Word at all. Five verses, uh, a little snippet of uh, daily life, uh, an anecdote that uh, may at, at first glance uh, seem, seem not to be all that uh, important or all that relevant. Uh, it, it is actually these uh, little snippets uh, that I always find encouraging. Uh, I, I always find that they strengthen my faith in the Word of God, and they do so for a couple of reasons. Uh, number one, uh, this bears the ring of real life. Anybody who has children knows that this rings true. Uh, if I had a dime for every time one of my children came to uh, either myself or my wife in a week, uh, having been assigned a task, usually as a community of children, and, and said, uh, Mom or Dad, so-and-so is not helping. I would be a wealthy man indeed. A and uh, yet we find that this is not an attitude that fades with childhood. We find that this is, in fact, uh, something that happens quite with some frequency in the church itself. Uh, many times... Uh, we find uh, that there, there are uh, some people in the congregation who are, are engaged, it seems, in, in every ministry of the congregation. They, they're very busy in good ways, invested in the kingdom of God, serving the well-being of the congregation. Um, but there's always the temptation to look at other people and to be critical of them for not being engaged in the service of the Lord. And we can so easily become critical, embittered, complaining. And I believe that is a great part of why this account is given to us in God's Word. You know, you think about Jesus' ministry. Uh, we understand that Jesus' ministry spanned roughly three years. Think about the thousands of interactions that Jesus had in three years. And of all the things that could be recorded in Holy Scripture, we have this account. What was Jesus talking about uh, at, at the time that this story takes place? It's not recorded for us. We don't know anything that Mary heard sitting at his feet. 
Uh, the Holy Spirit in, in uh, sovereign wisdom leaves that all uh, by the side and gives us this instead. And I hope that that compels you as it has compelled me to understand uh, that this is, in fact, important, as is every part of the Word of God. Well, uh, we're going to look at these verses, and our theme for this evening is the good portion. Uh, we're going to do this a bit differently than uh, you're accustomed to from me, and we're just going to kind of walk through, and, and we're going to unfold the story together, and, and uh, we trust the Lord that, that it will come together neatly this evening. Uh, first of all, we're introduced uh, for the first time to this woman named Martha, at least for the first time in Luke's gospel, of course. Uh, Martha, her sister Mary, their brother Lazarus are very well known to us who are familiar with the Bible. Uh, we know that this gr uh, group of three siblings were special friends of the Lord Jesus. We know that they lived in a town called Bethany, uh, which was uh, just, I believe, about two miles from Jerusalem itself. Uh, we know that uh, at one point in his ministry, Lazarus, uh, Jesus actually raises uh, Lazarus, the brother of uh, Martha and Mary, who's not even mentioned here. Uh, we know that the Lord Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. His family's well known to us. It's a family uh, who head for head loves Jesus, and isn't that a wonderful thing to see? Um, sometimes it seems that Martha gets knocked about a bit, uh, and, and perhaps unjustly so. Because what we see is that Martha is a woman who has uh, a heart for hospitality. Look at what the text says. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home to him. A simple statement, but a profound statement, a beautiful statement. We know that the Lord Jesus was not welcomed everywhere that he went. Uh, we also know that Jesus tended to travel with a crowd, and um, imagine the inconvenience uh, that, that uh, accrued to having Jesus in your home, uh, because wherever Jesus went, you had almost certainly his 12 disciples, um, and uh, quite often a much larger group of people that were in attendance as well. And it takes a special uh, kind of person, it takes a special kind of heart to open your home to such a gathering, especially uh, impromptu. <clears throat> uh, we don't read that, that Martha sent out an invitation to Jesus to come to her house. Uh, we, don't, we don't read uh, that, that Martha had uh, three weeks to plan this dinner, like some of you ladies would plan a Thanksgiving or a Christmas dinner, and, and you're already thinking about the menu, and you're cleaning your house, and, and uh, perhaps you're divvying up the work among family members and guests. But this woman, Martha, she, she's a woman who has a heart for hospitality. She's a woman who cares for Jesus. She's drawn to Jesus, and what she wants is to have Jesus in her home, and that's a beautiful, beautiful thing. Whatever else is said this evening, we don't want to lose that. Well, we find uh, that this woman, Martha, uh, welcomes uh, Jesus into her home, uh, but then we read in verse 39 that she had a sister called Mary who sat at the, the Lord's feet listening to what he said. Now, uh, Luke uh, gives us uh, some hints at what we are to think about, the, uh, uh, think about this act of Mary, this picture of Mary, uh, by the words that he chooses to use. Uh, one of the things that I found as I was studying uh, for this evening is that uh, the word that he uses uh, for hearing uh, is a, a major theme for Luke, the importance of, of listening to Jesus. Uh, the first reference, actually, to, to uh, hearing uh, or, or uh, the reception of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke is that well-known event when uh, Mary, Jesus' mother, goes to visit her cousin Elizabeth, and uh, when the babe in Elizabeth's womb heard the, the greeting of Mary, what happened? Leaped for joy in her womb. Uh, we find uh, that as the Gospel of Luke unfolds, uh, that 
the birth of, first of John and then of Jesus and the, the fact that God is clearly working in a particular way is attended by much joy and it's attended by much excitement. And then as, as uh, Jesus grows into adulthood and he begins his ministry, uh, we see uh, the eagerness of many to listen to Jesus. We see that Jesus uh, tells a parable on hearing, uh, a parable we more commonly know uh, are commonly know as the parable of the sower. Uh, if you look at Luke chapter 8, verses 1 through 15, uh, the point of the story is all about hearing, and it's about how we hear, and uh, we understand that there are different kinds of hearers. And so we begin to get a sense uh, as we're reading through Luke's gospel, and now we come to this account of Mary, uh, that Mary is also a special kind of woman. For she's a woman who delights to be in the presence of Jesus. She's a woman who uh, we read in our text, as, uh, as she scanned the room, she took her seat at the feet of Jesus. What a beautiful, beautiful place to be. You see, she personifies actually what we read in Luke 9, verse 35, the transfiguration, right? Um, and, and the disciples, uh, particularly Peter, we read they're so focused on what they see. And there is a voice that comes from uh, heaven that says, this is my son, hear him. And then, of course, uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, we read uh, Luke chapter 10, verse 24. If you just look up the page or over a page, uh, Jesus uh, said to the disciples, For I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. You see, uh, Mary understands the time. She understands the unique opportunity that she has. And as uh, she considers all that's unfolding, what she wants more than anything else is to be at the foot of Jesus. Uh, really, the, the way in which... Uh, the words are arranged, we don't see this so clearly in English, is uh, that she was listening to the words of Jesus. We might say uh, in, in our idiom, she was hanging on every word of Jesus. And that is the delight of the Christian's heart, isn't it? To hear the voice of Jesus, to be taught by Jesus, isn't, I mean, isn't that truly our longing? I'm not asking if that's what we experience on a daily basis. We're, get, we're going to get to that in a moment. But the longing of the redeemed heart is communion with the Lord. The longing of the redeemed heart is to sit at the feet of Jesus and to be instructed by him. And we see that Mary is characterized by this longing. But we read in, in verse 40, but Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Actually, you could translate this text, but Martha was distracted by much ministry. That would be the more literal translation. Uh, the word uh, uh, used uh, uh, of, of, uh, that I've just translated ministry. Uh, you could also translate it service. It's that word diakonos, which we, from which we get our term deacon, uh, used of all kinds of service, but especially uh, in the biblical usage, it's associated with ministry. Um, it may be used of men or women, and it's used of every uh, kind of ministry, uh, a great variety of ministry, whether of uh, that of the, the uh, church leaders or whether that of uh, the most obscure servant of the Lord in his or her uh, service to the Lord. Martha is distracted with much ministry. And that happens. Has that ever happened to you? That we would serve him ministry is emphatically a good thing. And um, th there are those... Uh, who maybe have a variety of gifts or have uh, per, uh, gifts that are more publicly known. And uh, over time, we begin to accumulate more and more uh, ministries. 
uh, because there's so many good things to do and we would like to be uh, involved in, in every one of them. And uh, things are going along smoothly until they aren't, until we find that ministry is a burden uh, rather than a joy, and until we find that ministry actually becomes a distraction from serving the Lord, like actually communing with Him, I mean. Ministry is tricky that way. And that's what happened to Martha. She's exercising her gift of hospitality. <laughs> I can only imagine um, how my wife and I would, uh, would be busying ourselves if 20 people showed up at the door tomorrow. Of course we would open the doors. Of course we would put a smile on our face. Of course we would say, come on in. And then we'd be anxiously whispering to each other, opening the fridge, opening the cupboards, uh, and, and trying to figure out what we're going to do. Good ministry so often eclipses communion with the Lord. And look at the, the effect that it produced in Martha's life. She was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. She came to him and asked, Lord, take, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Now, notice this, that Mary's request for, or or rather, Martha's request for Mary to to help is not wrong. Um, That's not where the problem lies, and that's not why this uh, story is given to us. Uh, Notice that what's wrong in the context, notice that what's wrong in this moment is the attitude that has developed in Martha. Uh, You can imagine her, uh, uh, this has never happened in our home, um, banging pots and pans, muttering under her breath, stomping around the kitchen, uh, just hoping that Mary's going to get the point, just hoping that Mary's going to come into the kitchen and help her. I'm not referring to my wife, by the way. Something's wrong in her heart. She's not just overworked and overburdened. She's angry. And notice how she talks to the Lord. There's actually, I I believe there's an irony here, right? Because uh, uh, what we have here is a, a very intentional use of the word Lord as opposed to the name Jesus. It doesn't say Uh, She came to him and asked Jesus. And uh, in verse 41, when when Jesus speaks to her, it doesn't say Jesus answered her. It says the Lord answered her. And and, uh, the uh, the way in which this comes out is is look at the end of verse 40. Um, She actually now has become the Lord. Uh, She's giving the Lord orders. And she's saying, tell her to do this. Don't you see what's going on? Tell her to get to work. Tell her to help me. Her anger isn't simply directed at her sister. Her anger is is directed even to her distinguished guest to some degree. Because her understanding has become obscure. What began as a good thing has now become a bad thing. Because her hospitality, in some sense, has become her God. Her ministry has become her God. Maybe she's seeking her sense of identity in her ministry. It doesn't say. But it has fouled her attitude. And this happens to us, doesn't it? When you find that, that you're crossing over from the point that ministry uh, is moving from being a joy to being a burden, take notice of that. When you find 
uh, that uh, ministry, rather than simply being a burden, now is something that causes you to grumble in your heart. Take note of that. When you find that your faithfulness and your engagement in your ministry now is is uh, causing anger to well up inside of you toward others uh, whom to your uh, sight, uh, to your perception, are not serving the Lord as they ought to be. Step aside. Take a moment to assess your ministry and to assess your relationship with the Lord. Can I be very honest with you? This happens to your pastor sometimes. That the process of studying the word in order to uh, to feed you week by week and and the process of of being engaged in in counseling or in in, um, leading this class or in being at that leadership meeting Um, After a while, uh, you're so focused on doing, 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 and if you're not actually doing, um, you're thinking about all the things that need to be done, and you're just being crushed. That's the reality for some of us. That's my reality. Can I say that? It sits on me like the weight of the world, and you just, uh, you, you, you become anxious, you become panicky. And when that's happening, the Lord says, Martha, Martha, Justin, Justin. Take a moment. Remind yourself of why you're doing this to begin with. Boys and girls, this applies to you too. Um, Again, let's go back to that scenario uh, where, where mom or dad sends uh, you and, and maybe a brother or a sister or maybe a, a few of you uh, to go do a job. Maybe it's to clean the room that you share with your brother or your sister, or maybe it's to clean the playroom. A- and inevitably, there's somebody who's not doing their work. Inevitably. That's just the way life works. Um, and, and parents take note of this as well, because um, uh, when, when that child comes to us and says, uh, so-and-so is not doing their work, um, uh, our knee-jerk response, our habitual response, is to rebuke the child that is not doing the work. Now, that is important and necessary. But that's also a time to examine our children and say, why do we do what we do? Boys and girls, why do you clean your room? Uh, why do you clean the basement? If you said, uh, because uh, I am uh, obeying my parents, that's a good answer. But notice, uh, know, know this, that in obeying your parents, the, the ultimate goal is to obey the Lord. And uh, we like to say in our home uh, that true obedience is to do what you're told uh, right away, all the way, with a happy heart. If you aren't doing it with a happy heart, that's not obedience. See, Martha, she's ministering, but she's not doing it with a happy heart. She's doing it because she feels obligated. And instead of thinking about her her work in the kitchen could be a joy, um, I get to serve Jesus. Her work has become a burden because she's focused on what everybody else is doing or not doing. Again, verse 41, Martha, Martha, the Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things anxious she's overwhelmed she's thinking about all that has to be done all that has to be prepared the list is long that's true the work seems never-ending that's true he says verse 42 but only one thing is needed a dear child of God can I speak to you for a moment before you know it your life is going to be over in this world goes by so quickly. And when you come to meet the Lord, 
while it is true uh, that, that our good works uh, follow us, our ministry follows us, the key point is your relationship to Jesus. We actually read of a class of people who do many mighty works in the name of the Lord, and the Lord utters that awful statement, depart from me, I never knew you. What an awful thing. You see, Jesus is, is, is not saying that service is unimportant, not at all. Uh, he's not saying, uh, well, you should just stop ministering now, Martha, and uh, take a seat. Uh, he's, he's not uh, really actually comparing Mary uh, as if she's the smarter sister or the better sister. That's not the point at all. But Jesus in love is, is speaking to, to Martha and, and uh, using really the same language that, the, uh, that Jesus uses of the Ephesian church in some sense uh, in Revelation. Uh, you have lost your first love. You've lost sight of the ball. You, you've forgotten what this is all about. Your time with me is, is limited. Um, you, you have the opportunity uh, to, to experience communion with me. But instead, you're so fo focused on what you're doing for me that you can't be served by me. Oh, I, I'm thinking of that, that, that passage, right, where Jesus says, uh, the Son of Man did not come to be served but to serve. Are you being served by Jesus? Because that's what Jesus is reminding us of this evening. Your service is important, but it's not ultimate. What is ultimate is that you be served by Jesus. And he's ready to serve you. He delights to serve you. He wants you to feed on him. He, he wants... Uh, you to be able to say with the psalmist, uh, Psalm 34, O oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Uh, you see, uh, Jesus, what, what, what is most uh, definitive of our lives is not that we serve Jesus, but that Jesus serves us, that he is, has come to give uh, his life as a ransom for us, that he has come to give us not only life, but as we said uh, some weeks ago, life abundantly, life more abundantly, uh, a fullness of life. Uh, that, that, that he has come to draw us into, uh, he has come to reconcile us to the Father and draw us into a relationship with uh, the Son and with the Father and with the Spirit. And whatever way we're engaged in ministry, we must never lose sight of this fact. We desperately need to be served by Jesus every day. He actually uses um, the word, a word that could, uh, would often be used in Greek, uh, for a meal, when he says, uh, Mary has chosen uh, what I, I would say literally, Mary has chosen the good portion. She took what was good on the buffet. Uh, there were different things on offer, and she took the good portion. Uh, she, she, she had her dessert, uh, you might say, uh, rather than, than uh, focusing on the salad, if I can use that illustration. That seems wrong somehow. But he says, Mary has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. So important for us to remember that when we meet Jesus face to face, when we stand before God's judgment seat, we won't be recounting all the mighty works or the good works that we've done for Jesus. That's not our refuge. That's not our hope. Jesus and his blood for me. Why am I here? I'm here because Jesus came to serve me. Now, I think that it's very helpful to understand that, that, that Jesus isn't simply adding another burden onto to Martha's life. You know, there is a way of looking at this idea and saying, oh, okay, so what you're saying is that I, I have to add a time with the Lord on top of what I'm already doing. Um, and, and that's not the point at all. 
Uh, Philip Ryken says, uh, quote, Jesus is not asking for something more from us. He is asking for less so that he can give us more of himself. Uh, if, if ministry has so completely overtaken our lives... Uh, that we cannot be served by Jesus, we're not being served by Jesus, then it's time for us to do a, a radical reevaluation of our priorities. And, and we may have to say uh, to ourselves, there is a time and there is a season for everything under the sun. And this seems strange, right? Because your pastor is almost proposing that you maybe need to step back from some kind of ministry right now, which is exactly the opposite of what pastors are supposed to say. I'm supposed to say, get to work, everyone. But Jesus is saying, let me serve you. Let me serve you. Because, you see, our service to Jesus, the only service that's really pleasing and acceptable to him is a service that is rendered in joy that flows out of him serving us first. I want to encourage you with that. As we kind of draw to this to a close this evening, a couple of thoughts. Number one, thank you to every single one of you who is serving in any way right now. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your labor. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for your investment. I praise God for that, and I thank God for you. Thought number two. Just encourage each one of you, as I've uh, been encouraged myself from this passage, to just do a little health check and say, number one, am I serving the Lord with joy? Is there joy in my service right now? Number two, um, does my service, ha has my service so overtaken my life that I don't have time to spend with Jesus? Or is that priority in place and, and I am taking time to be served by Jesus? I am being fed by Jesus. And then learn uh, from this account. You see, uh, the beautiful thing is, is what we actually see is, is we simply see a woman who's in process. Right? Uh, we see somebody who's in the process of, of, uh, of being shaped by Jesus. Uh, we find later, I, I believe it is later, that uh, Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead. Again, the timeline in Luke is a little bit shifty in terms of the arrangement. Uh, we find that rather than serving the funeral guests uh, uh, that she undoubtedly has as a result of her brother's death, um, when she hears of the Lord's approach, she goes out to meet him. Because she's learned something and she's grown and she's learned, uh, uh, at least to some extent, uh, what Jesus meant when he said only one thing is needed. Only one thing is necessary. And she's learned that there's a time to put down the work and simply seek communion with the Lord. Brothers and sisters, as we serve the Lord, let us remember that whatever we do is actually powered by Him. And if it isn't, it's, it's empty and in vain. And let us then serve with joy when we're tempted to, to look at others who aren't involved there are ways of talking to, to them and, and seeking to involve other people, and that's good. But let us not become critical, judgmental of them. Let us not become grumbling and angry. 
because that says more about us than it says about that person. It's a window into a heart that is sick and desperately in need of time spent at the Lord Jesus' feet. Let's pray. Gracious Father in heaven, we come to you this evening so thankful that you did not come to be served, uh, but to serve and to give your life a ransom for many, and we are the beneficiaries of that. Uh, we pray, Lord, that we would never lose sight of this and that we would never lose sight of our own desperate need to be strengthened, sustained, and fed by you. Uh, Lord, uh, we pray that you would revive each one of us in service to you, <clears throat> that you would engage those who are disengaged, that you would grant rest to those uh, who are weary and overburdened, and that especially, Lord, that you would teach all of us to, to rightly uh, prioritize the need for communion with you, uh, that we may serve you with joy and that we may be uh, both like Mary, who hung on your every word, and like Martha, who were engaged faithfully in service, uh, that you may be glorified in our lives. Uh, for we ask it all in the name of Jesus. Amen.